to the rest of you for joining us today. We appreciate your uh, time knowing that, that all of you have busy schedules and uh, we want to be a partner to you in providing education services and information about um, the areas in which we provide services as well as offering you uh, our services in terms of consulting and auditing if you're, if you're interested. Uh, as we begin, I need to provide a disclaimer that we provide at the beginning of all of our, our uh, educational seminars and, and webinars. Um, this information that we're providing to you today is provided by Kirkpatrick Price for educational and informational purposes only, and what we're uh, communicating to you today does not constitute legal advice. So no attorney-client relationship is established by viewing this presentation, and should you need legal, legal advice, please consult with your own attorney. Now that we've given our uh, legal disclaimer, I want to uh, start with a summary for GDPR. I anticipate that most of you are at least somewhat familiar with it, but I know that uh, that, that familiarity varies across the spectrum as we're talking with existing and potential clients and those uh, that we interact with um, from an industry perspective. And so I want to start with a high-level overview really quickly. If you need um, a more extensive overview of GDPR, I want to refer you to the previous webinar we did uh, last month, and uh, that's, that's been recorded, and you can um, view that um, on your own time, and uh, we walk through the entire law um, at a high level. But just in summary, GDPR essentially does three things. It's a data protection law um, based out of the EU that grants rights to data subjects, those uh, whose data is being used and processed. It creates obligations uh, for protecting that data uh, for the organizations that are processing the data, and then it establish, establishes enforcement authority, which includes oversight and uh, sanctions for noncompliance. And so because, uh, because GDPR both grants rights and creates obligations, um, it also creates classes of obligations within the law. And so we're going to spend uh, today's session going into a little bit more depth than we did in our previous session about roles under GDPR. There are essentially two primary roles um, uh, under the law. Those are controller and processor. And then as we conclude that, we're going to talk about, um, ask and answer the question, where do we start? These are the two questions that we get the most. Um, as an organization, we figured these would be the two questions that would be appropriate to address. So we're going to ask and answer the question, what is our role under the law? And then ask and answer the question, where do we start? So a pretty simple agenda for today, and uh, that's where we're headed. So as I said, um, the question of what is our role under the law is the question that we get most frequently from clients and uh, others that we interact with in the industry. If they have a sense enough to know that they may or are subject to GDPR because they process data from EU data subjects, then they, they may know enough to know that there are a couple of different potential options for their requirements under the law, and they, they ask us, what role do we serve? Are we a controller or are we a processor? And so it's, it's by far the most popular question. Additionally, when we are performing GDPR engagements, this question has provided uh, some of the, the greatest challenges in um, identifying compliance gaps, making recommendations, um, establishing priorities, reviewing risk, um, because organizations are sometimes not sure whether they are a, a controller or a processor. Um, they're not sure which data they have, even when they do uh, have that data, there are, there are questions that we're going to address and, and sub-issues that we're going to address that make it challenging to determine um, what their obligations are. So um, you, you can't know uh, what you have to do under GDPR without knowing whether you are a controller or a processor. And then the final thing that makes this, at least for our purposes, the final thing that makes this issue challenging is textual ambiguity. And by that, I mean the law does, defines uh, both of the terms um, that we're going to talk about, but it, it um, leaves a lot to be desired from my perspective in terms of giving, giving guidance. So we're going to go through um, some textual review. We're also going to do some practical consideration. And then um, as we're talking about the controller processor role, we're going to look at the most um, uh, helpful guidance that, that I know of that's out there from a supervisory authority and, and see what uh, that guidance has for us as we, as we ask that question. So let's, let's uh, give a warning um, before we get into the rest of 
uh, what the law says about um, whether an organization is a controller or a processor. Organizations that are looking to justify their status under the law could inaccurately identify their status now and in the future. Let me give you an example. Um, if, if we're engaging in a conversation with someone and they're talking to us about GDPR and they said, we're a processor, so we don't need to evaluate our data any further, um, that's a warning sign to me that that organization may uh, potentially also be a controller or at least should evaluate whether it's a controller. Or uh, an organization that says, uh, we're neither a, a processor or a controller because we're not based in the EU and uh, we don't have any EU employees or contractors and um, you know, I, I, don't, I know that we don't have any data. Those, those are warning signs to me that an organization, unless their review has been absolutely thorough, documented, performed by somebody with expertise and credibility, and if, if they're looking from the outset, if we are looking from the outset to justify the position that we have under the law, I think we're in trouble. So I wanna give a warning to all of us to be open-minded um, to, uh, to whatever uh, our organization's processes lead us to. So with that warning out of the way, let's, let's look at what the law says. So the law under Article 3 says it applies to the processing of personal data of data subjects via a controller or processor. GDPR is written um, without a whole lot of explanatory or, or um, signposting language to let you even know that there are two roles that uh, organizations could serve under the law. It just simply says that the law applies to controllers and processors. It does, the law though does define in Article 4 the terms controller and processor. A controller means a natural or legal person which determines the purposes and means of processing of personal data. And a processor means a natural legal person who, which processes personal data on behalf of the controller. There is an additional role under the law, which is a joint controller. That's, uh, as the law defines, where two or more controllers jointly determine the purpose and means of processing. Um, so in this case, the, the law, in several cases, violates the, the rule about definition, which is it, it uses the term um, within the definition. So that's one of the challenges with textual ambiguity. The fact that the law doesn't use other words to give us guidance besides the words processing or joint and those two definitions. At least in the, in the case of the definition of the word controller, it gives us a couple of different parts of, of guidance. Uh, it, it tells us that um, the controller does two things, at least two things. It determines the purpose of processing and then it determines the means of processing. Now, from my perspective, the ability to determine the purpose of data processing is both easier to determine and a more logical standard for um, identifying whether an organization is a data controller than whether an entity determines the means of processing. Also, when we get to the section later on in our, our presentation about uh, the supervisory authority guidance, the guidance that we're gonna review is both implicit and explicit about a processor's ability to determine the means of processing while still serving as a processor. So even though the law explicitly says a controller determines the means of processing personal data, we have supervisory authority guidance that says, well, that's sort of true. So um, I wanna look at some, in the next slide, we're gonna look at some implications from the text and some practical considerations when evaluating whether our organization is a controller or processor or potentially a, a joint uh, controller. First, I wanna identify something that is irrelevant when trying to determine whether your organization is um, a controller or a processor, or two, two things. One is organizational size. A uh, part, a very small part of GDPR addresses organizations that are less than 250 employees but that does not impact whether an organization is a controller or a processor. Additionally, organizational structure, whether it's a um, uh, wholly owned subsidiary, parent organization, affiliate, um, however an organization is uh, designed and built is irrelevant to whether an organization is a controller or a processor. Now with those two things out of the way, we can talk about a few things that tell us um, give us some relevance about whether an organization is a, a controller or a processor. First, um, the processing activity that the organization engages in is, is partially relevant. Let me give you some, some more guidance on that. 
So activities that could be performed by both a controller and a processor include marketing, analytics, debt collection, outgoing written communication, data storage, customer service, and shipping and receiving. All of those activities could be performed by an organization that is a controller under the law or a processor under the law. And the reason is that because ultimately a controller can perform any activity that a processor can perform. But there are some uh, processing activities that have been specifically identify, identified by um, the ICO, the UK Supervisory Authority, as examples of control activity, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. So process act activity is only really partially relevant. There are some processing activities that would be difficult to engage in um, without being a, a controller, but it's possible. For example, customer service activities, it's possible for an organization to be a processor and engage in customer service activities. But I think um, that's going to be incredibly difficult. On the other hand, uh, data storage activities um, are, are much more likely to be uh, engaged in by an entity as long as it's not doing anything else with data subjects, uh, personal data uh, on the processor side of things. So processing activity is, is sort of partially relevant. Um, data source is incredibly relevant. Um, so part of understanding your organization's role under the law is to determine where, where you get your data. It's not, it's not dispositive because um, there are a couple of different ways that a controller can get data. But um, if your data source is the data subject itself, then your organization is much more likely, although not dispositive, as, as I said, to be a controller. So, uh, for example, if, if your data source is the, um, the data subject, not only from a legal perspective, but just from a practical perspective, the more direct interaction an organization has with a data subject, the more likely it is to be viewed by a supervisory authority as a controller because of the greater likelihood of risks to the data subject's rights and freedoms and the greater likelihood um, that that organization is gonna have some ability to determine what and how to use the data um, when they're directly interacting with the data subject. So this isn't something that's specified or explicit within the text of GDPR, but it's based on my experience of working for um, government enforcement agencies and on behalf of regulated entities. So um, this is me trying to give you a principle um, that's derived out of experience and perspective that uh, data source um, and uh, data subject interaction, the more you experience, uh, the more you get your data from the data subject and the more you interact with the data subject, the more likely you are to be a, uh, a, a controller. Now, it should be noted that controllers could get uh, data subject data and serve as a controller by buying or receiving information, personal data from another controller. And in that case, there would be entities um, who are in the joint processor role. So for uh, organizations that uh, are heavy into data mining and have under uh, legal authority to sell or transfer that data, they're gonna become a controller and organizations that buy that data or receive that data for the purposes of doing marketing or uh, performing good services for are going to be joint controllers. And then a fourth uh, principle for helping us determine um, whether we are a processor controller is our contractual arrangements. Those are completely relevant. Um, those should set forth, and I, I say should because, um, because we're be before May 25th, I recognize that um, the rush to get everyone's paper uh, straight and updated is ongoing, um, but contractual arrangements are completely relevant ways to determine whether a processor controller or joint processor um, if they give us leeway or if they're incredibly strict with respect to uh, discretion in determining the purpose and means of data. So uh, for example, if your contract allows you to, as I said earlier, sell or transfer the data, then you um, are more likely to be viewed as a controller. If your contract allows you to um, market to the data subject, you're likely to be a controller. Um, if your contract allows you to market the data subject 
not to the su data subject, but to other organizations, you are more likely to be a controller. If your contract allows you to independently access, analyze, store, or review the data subject data, uh, apart from anything that another organization is asking you or contracting with you to do, then you're more likely to be a, a controller. One of the things I've noted in reviewing contracts recently that relate to GDPR is, uh, is a term, um, two terms. One is research and one is product improvement. So if we're talking about contractual arrangements and asking the question about what discretion do they give an organization and saying that the more discretion they give, the more likely an organization is to be a controller and the less discretion the contract gives, the less likely the organization is to be a controller and the more likely they are to be a processor. Um, I want to talk about research and product, develop, uh, product improvement. Um, I think there is some gray area uh, here between uh, the product improvement coverage of contract language that facilitates an organization being a processor and the activities that actually require some independent authority and decision making um, that could lead to an organization being a controller um, in spite of or even sort of within the contractual language. So things, as I said, like research and product improvement, an organization should look internally and decide what exactly that means for its organization and determine whether or not that could be specified more explicitly within the contract or if even without outside of updating the contract, whether or not those activities involve some independence from the relationship um, and uh, purposes and means of processing uh, if you're getting data from another organization. So if you have viewed yourself as a processor because you have a contract with another organization, because you get data from another organization, and because your contract says that you're only to provide services under the authority of that organization, but that contract also gives you the ability to do research and do product improvement with that data, um, I, would, I would say look um, to see if the language in the contract can be specified to more accurately reflect beyond just product improvement research and look at your activities to see if that research involves some independence from uh, or could be viewed as involving some independence from the organization that provides you with the data. Now, with respect to uh, the processing means uh, of a contract term, um, you know, for example, we could be talking about whether the, the contract specifies automated versus manual processing or a post-purchase survey versus targeted email campaigns if we're talking about marketing. Those are some things that could be specified in a contract. And the more specific the means of processing uh, are in a contract, um, and the less authority the, the processing means gives uh, your organization, then the more likely you're to be viewed as a processor with respect to that data. But the supervisory authority guidance that we're gonna look at uh, identified some specific processing means that are more technical in nature that could create confusion for organizations that otherwise believe they are processors, but are making decisions regarding one or more of those technical aspects. So um, there's a lot more clarity from, from my perspective that um, the more your organization determines the purpose of a data, of data processing that you are a controller, there's less clarity regarding um, determination regarding the means of processing and what that means for an organization. So since we've talked about it a couple different times, let's move on to this supervisory authority guidance and see what it has for us. I'm specifically referring to the UK supervisory authority called the Information Commissioner's Office, uh, abbreviated as the ICO. The guidance is entitled Data Controllers and Data Processors, what the difference is and what the governance implications are. And this guidance was actually published in 2014, so before GDPR came into effect and before um, GDPR is going to be enforceable. But the ICO reauthorized uh, this guidance in 2017 and said now that GDPR um, is the data protection law that the UK is, is going to be subject to, this guidance still applies. And uh, I am only an English speaker, so I know that there is guidance produced by supervisory authorities around the EU, but from what I have read um, that is available to me, uh, this is the sole guidance on the controller processor dynamics. So um, uh, we're gonna lean heavily into this with the grain of salt that there could be other uh, supervisory guidance uh, on this topic out there. And because it was published before GDPR, that it could be challenged or there could be uh, weaknesses in it based on the fact that it didn't anticipate the exact language of the text. Um, 
but this is the only real guidance that we know of, so we're going to look at it for some additional principles and some support of the principles that we've already talked about. So, uh, to determine whether an organization is a controller, the ICR's guidance listed some issues related to purposes of processing that are solely under the discretion of the controller. So uh, these, these bullets that you see in front of you are, if, if you determine them, then you, your organization is a controller. So if you determine to collect personal data in the first place, and you determine the legal basis for collecting that data, you are a controller. If you determined which items of personal data to collect, then the ICO sees you as a controller. If you determine the purposes for that data collection, then you are a controller. If you decide which individuals to collect data about, then you're a controller. If you decide uh, whether to disclose the data and to whom uh, you're going to disclose the data, then you are a controller. Um, if you are making decisions about data subject access and other individual uh, data subject rights uh, with respect to their, their personal data, then you are a controller. And if you're making decisions about how long to retain data and whether or not to uh, make specific amendments and rectification to that data, then you are uh, a controller. Um, in sum, the, the guidance says activities such as interpretation, the exercise of professional judgment, or significant decision-making in relation to, to personal data must be carried out by a data controller. So these are some bullet points um, which you could take to your organization, both um, as it's currently processing data and as it anticipates processing data um, on or after May 25th, as well as taking these items to your, your contracts, to your paper, and seeing whether or not your, your paper gives you the authority to make decisions around any one of these items. From my perspective, um, only one of the decision-making about one of these items, just one of these items, could lead your organization to be uh, determined to be a controller. The guidance also addresses potential uh, principles regarding the means of processing, although this is where, as we talked about, the, the guidance is a little more murky about who has the authority and whether or not that means uh, that authority means uh, an entity is a, a controller. Um, it's, it, first, the guidance uses the word may, um, but it says controllers may determine what IT systems or other method, methods are used to collect personal data. Uh, controllers may determine how to store personal data. Controllers may determine the security details. Controllers may determine uh, the transfer mechanisms. Controllers may determine retrieval uh, mechanisms. Controllers may determine methods for ensuring a data retention schedules are complied with. And finally, controllers may determine the means used to delete or dispose of data. Now, I think the fact that the, the guy that uses the word may means that there is a difference between the way a supervisory authority, at least the ICO, would, would view an organization that has discretion regarding one or more of these items and still potentially view that organization as a processor. So, um, you know, that the discretion seems like, in, in general, just from a practical business perspective, that an organization, a processor, should have discretion about data storage um, or uh, IT systems. But beyond just that practical sense, which isn't worth a whole lot when you're dealing with um, the significant pen penalties under GDPR, we now have this guidance that says, Controllers may determine this, and we have some, some language within the guidance that says uh, the data controller must exercise overall control over the purpose for which and the manner in which personal data are processed. So it says that, but then it goes on to sort of contradict that or limit it by saying, however, in reality, a data processor can itself exercise some control over the manner of processing. So. Uh, for example, the technical aspects about how a particular service is delivered. So to me, it seems like there is the ability for an organization to have authority and discretion, including explicit authority under the, the contract or um, implicit authority because the contract doesn't specify, for example, the data retention schedule, or it doesn't specify um, the data storage requirements. Um, an organization could have authority and decision-making ability over that, those areas and still be considered a processor. 
So um, let's look at a couple of different examples that are listed within the ICO guidance um, that, that includes some of the principles of decision making regarding uh, whether an organization is a controller or processor, um, but also gives some indication that supervisory authorities may select um, certain activities to be controller activities because of the risk or sort of ad hoc. So first is market research. Um, the ICO guidance gives an example of an entity that is hired by a controller to conduct market research. And um, the example, in the example, the market research company is given discretion regarding the sample size, the interview methods, the presentation of results, what information to collect from data subjects, and which data subjects to review. And as a result of that authority, um, the ICO guidance says that the market research company, even though it's hired by another organization um, to conduct the services and does not independently conduct those market research services, the market research entity is a controller. The next one uh, example is, is about payment processing. Um, and in this case, we have one of our examples about um, direct data subject interaction indicating that an organization is a, a controller. So in this case, um, an online retailer works with a third-party payment processor, and the ICO says that the, the payment processor is a controller even if uh, there's a contract between the online retailer and the payment processor because of several things. The payment processor decides which information it needs from customers. The payment processor exercises control over the customer data. For example, in this case, the ICO gave the, the payment processor the ability to, to conduct direct marketing to the data subjects. The payment processor has its own legal requirements to meet as a payment processor, and the payment processor has its own terms and conditions that apply directly to the retailer's customers, to the data subjects. So in this case, uh, we have an example that gives us an indication of what is explicit from the text, which is um, decision-making over the purposes of the data. For example, the direct marketing, make an organization controller. Um, but we also have these kind of principles that we've talked about that are outside of the law, which one, um, if there are uh, direct um, data uh, subject interaction, then you're more likely to be viewed as a controller. And uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more later on with the next example, but um, if there are additional legal obligations to meet um, aside from anything applied by um, the controller organization, then an entity is more likely to be viewed as a controller. Uh, to talk more about the, the legal obligations, we can talk about the next example, which um, there are two examples, but they both involve professional services of lawyers and accountants. And um, the ICO said be because in both cases, the lawyers and, and accountants determine the means of processing uh, data, and in some cases, even potentially the purposes of processing the data, um, they are both controllers. Specifically, though, the ICO called out the professional obligations that certain professional service providers have that could, that would make them controllers, specifically because it could require that those um, professional services uh, organizations disclose data that might be, in a way that might be contrary to a client's desire. So, for example, if um, an accountant is, uh, uncovers some criminal activity or a lawyer is put in the position to participate in criminal activity in a way that it violates their, um, their ethical requirements, the lawyer would be obligated to disclose that activity, and that would, in, in general, violate um, GDPR requirements, um, except that, you know, there are other legal obligations. Or, for example, if an accountant or a lawyer was obligated to disclose some sort of fraud based on a legal obligation or professional obligation. The ICO said that those professional obligations and, and other professional obligations like um, the requirements on lawyers and accountants make uh, those professional services uh, controllers. The, the next example is an IT services example. So in this case, there was a location uh, data tracking service that provided services to an organization that had a fleet of vehicles. And the ICO said that because the data tracking service um, had the freedom to decide which data elements to collect and how to analyze the data, the data tracking service was a controller. In this case, to me, it's just reinforcing um, what we've already known 
with a different example that the ability to um, have discretion about uh, how to use the data makes an organization a controller. And then finally, the last example is for cloud service providers. Um, in this case, the ICO gave an example of a cloud service provider who is retained to store, delete, and provide data subjects direct access to their own data. In this case, the ICO said that um, the cloud service provider was a data processor because their contract did not allow the, the cloud provider any ability to use the data for their own purpose or have any discretion regarding um, the means of processing outside of the contract. So again, this just reinforces the, the idea that you have to look at your contract terms um, to guide you in, in making a decision about whether your organization is a, a controller or a processor. So to summarize the, the principles that we've gotten from the uh, ICO guidance, um, decision-making matters. That's clear not only from the ICO guidance, but from the text of GDPR. Customer interaction matters. That's something that is sort of unique to the, the ICO guidance that's not explicitly spelled out in the text of the law. Other obligations such as professional or legal obligations like the credit card, uh, the payment processor, and uh, the lawyers and the accountants, those obligations matter and are almost entirely likely to make an organization a controller. And then finally, contract terms matter. So the discretion given or withheld in a document, in a, in a servicing agreement, um, is going to be used to determine, should be used by the entities, but also will be used by supervisory authorities to determine whether an organization is a controller or a processor. So now that we've talked at length and tried to identify both the text, practical implications, and some supervisory authority guidance regarding controller and processor relationships, let's talk a little bit about um, the next question that, that is frequently asked, which is where do we start? And I want to give you four items to start with, four actions to start with. And I, I chose these because for two reasons. One, they, I think, are the most pressing areas uh, upon an organization in terms of GDPR compliance. And two, they're the most universally applicable because they're uh, useful and good starting places for um, processors and controllers. So no matter what determination you came out of um, from the first part of our presentation, these uh, suggestions are useful and could be useful for you. First, let's talk about data mapping. Um, well, I've received some pushback from organizations with respect to conducting data mapping. I don't see how it's possible to determine whether an organization is a controller or a processor without a full knowledge of the personal data that it holds, where the data comes from, and how the organization processes the data. In addition to just determining whether an organization is a controller or a processor, uh, data mapping also seems like a logical and necessary step to fulfill certain other aspects of GDPR compliance. For example, the required information that controllers have to give data subjects and supervisory authorities, I think, is, comes out of data mapping. Um, data protection impact assessments, records of processing for both controllers and processors, and then facilitating data subjects' rights. Those all, to me, require um, a documented understanding of what data you have and where that data goes. Uh, and up in front of you, you have a very rudimentary uh, data mapping uh, that I created to give you just a sense of some of the considerations for a really limited perspective that a um, that could both controllers and processors might have to, to give consideration to when, when we're talking about data mapping. So in this case, we're talking about a data subject who is a candidate for employment at an organization, and that data subject provides their data to a third-party staffing firm, a recruiting firm, for assistance in finding employment. And that third-party staffing firm uh, submits personal data about that data subject to an organization's human resources uh, function. And then from the human resources function, you can see that that um, human resources uh, function sends the data to other uh, parts of the organization, as well as a third-party background screen provider who also provides the data within the organization. So if that data subject were to find out about a negative uh, uh, mark on that candidate's 
um, background screening, for example, from the third-party background screen provider and would contest the accuracy of that and make a request that the data be rectified. Both of the third parties and the organization that, that is considering hiring the candidate um, would need to know where the data is flowing in order to determine first whether they're a controller or a processor, and second, um, what kind of activities they should take if the if the data request is indeed um, a valid one, the, the data rectification request is indeed a valid one. So um, uh, I think data mapping is a critical area, uh, and it's it's I chose it first because I think it's it's the best place to start. It provides the most value. Um, in terms of multiple areas under the law in which your organization is going to need to know certain pieces of information, the data mapping gives you the most coverage. Um, and the last part about data mapping that I want to point out is an area that I think has the potential to trip up some organizations that view themselves as processors, and I think a, a data map would um, help them see that they, they may be both processors and controllers, and that's um, for SaaS providers who perform support activities um, in support of their, of their software, if they receive personal data um, um, in terms of, for example, live or remote support, then they might move from, uh, you know, they otherwise might be a processor, but if they're engaged in support activities that directly involve interaction with the data subject and receiving personal data from that data subject, then um, I, I believe those organizations are also going to be a controller. And I think a data map would be the place where they might first uncover that. So I recommend that all organizations start with, with data mapping in terms of their, their GDPR compliance efforts. The second area that I recommend um, organizations looking at both controllers and processes, processors is their, their contract management. First, all organizations, whatever role you have, especially if you have both controller and processor roles, need to look at the agreements that you have with controllers and processes, processors for a couple of different reasons. First, a written agreement is required to exist between controllers and processors in order to, to process data in a way that is compliant with the law. Second, there are elements that GDPR specifically lays out that are required elements under the law. And then um, there are some uh, requirements if a, uh, between processors and sub-processors, and those agreements um, have to mirror the controller-processor agreement. So whatever discretion is given in the, the agreement between a controller and a processor, if that processor goes out and employs one or more sub-processors, um, the discretion has to mirror um, and the required elements have to mirror the arrangement between the controller and the original processor. So you, you need to be looking both up and down your data flow to determine where your data goes so that you can know with whom you should have a contractual relationship and what kind of contractual relationship you should have and then what should be included in those contracts. And then, um, so the question is, you know, do all vendors or partners have the appropriate agreement based on, on their role? Um, so this is not just about the elements within the contract, but determining who are your processors, who are your other joint controllers, and do they have the, the proper arrangement? So that's sort of a, a one-time snapshot activity that I think organizations should engage in. But then going forward, those organizations should have a process to ensure that before um, your organization signs a new agreement or, or transfers any data to another organization, there should be a review to determine if that other organization is uh, another, if there's uh, data subject to GDPR that's going to be transferred, and if so, what kind of arrangement exists between your organization and that new organization, and to make sure the proper paper is put in place. The third area I would recommend an organization look at when starting their GDPR compliance effort is their, the documentation that they have to have internally. So the law requires specifically some information for controllers to provide with data subjects in Articles 13 and 14. In one case, it's when the data is received directly from the data subject, and in Article 14, it's when the data is not received directly from the data subject, and the law specifies the, the elements of, of what must be shared with the data subject. And then uh, Article 30 references records of processing that um, 
in general are going to be required for processors and controllers. There's a couple of different um, requirements, but I think many controllers and processors are going to meet the threshold. And again, the law lays out specifically what elements uh, of those records controllers and processors should maintain. Again, if the data mapping is completed, I think you'll have a much um, better ability to complete those records of processing. And then finally, policies and procedures. While some organizations may um, have to draft new policies and procedures for things like data subject rights, there should be policies and procedures uh, in general in place, you know, if your organization is following best practices for whatever industry you're in um, for some of your processing activities. Um, and so those, those policies and procedures should be reviewed and updated um, to include the GDPR aspects. Then our fourth um, area, uh, if we are looking at where to start in terms of GDPR compliance, uh, is the question about security standards. So from my perspective, GDPR is a um, data protection law that is much more process-oriented in nature and less technical in nature. The text of the law says that both controllers and processors have to have what's called appropriate technical and organizational controls. It, the law does not specify what those technical and organizational controls should be. In the future, supervisory authorities um, and, and other guidance from the EU may give us what those specifications are, what controls are both appropriate from a technical and organizational perspective, but at the moment the law doesn't the law doesn't say it, at the moment we don't have those certifications. So each organization has to first define what is appropriate uh, for the organization based on um, the type of processing that it's engaged in and the type of data that it processes. And then um, each organization needs to monitor that appropriateness going forward. So if processing activities change, then the, the controls that were once appropriate from a technical and organizational perspective may no longer be appropriate. If the type of data, if the processing stays the same, but the type of data changes, if you move into something that is one of the sensitive or special categories of data, for example, healthcare data, if you are at one time not, not processing healthcare data, but you start processing healthcare data, what was once appropriate might no longer be appropriate. If you weren't processing the data of children at one point, but you are going to start processing the data of children, the controls that were appropriate from a technical and organizational perspective that before you process the data of children may no longer be appropriate. Um, so what, what standards you use, um, you know, there are a couple of different ways that you could look at this. You're just, your organization has to make a determination that is defensible. So you could use a third party to assist you in identifying what standards are appropriate for your organization. You could use a defined standard, such as a certification that eventually comes out, or something like ISO 27000, or some of the NIST standards, or PCI. I'm not, I'm not endorsing any of those options. I'm simply identifying them as examples of what is a um, objective standard that may be in whole or in part appropriate for your organization. Or you could come up with some custom internal process that, that has demonstrable outcomes of compliance that could establish um, what is appropriate for your organization. So, um, as we wrap things up, the, uh, we started with the biggest question that, that I think everybody is asking, and that is, if GDPR applies, is your organization a controller or a processor? Some things to consider when you're trying to answer that question is, what is your data source? If it's the data subject, um, you're much, although not guaranteed to be a controller, you're much more likely to be a controller. If you have direct data subject interaction, you're not guaranteed to be a controller, but you're more likely to be one. If your contract gives your organization discretion, certainly about the purposes of processing, but potentially even about the means of processing, you could be a controller. And then finally, if there are other legal or professional obligations upon your organization that are outside of the contract or outside the business relationship with another organization who is providing you with personal data, then you are potentially a controller. And then if we're talking about where to start once you've identified your role or uh, as a part of identifying your role under the law, follow the data. Do some, some really good data mapping and you'll not only have a better time determining whether you're a controller or a processor under the law, but you'll, you'll serve your organization well in, in uh, fulfilling some of the other requirements under GDPR. Start the paper chase. Look through your contracts and agreements. 
make sure they contain the required elements and that you have the proper contracts with um, parties with whom you either send or receive personal data from data subjects in the EU. Um, look at your documentation. Do you have policies and procedures in place that reference and comply with GDPR? Do you have the required processing activities? Um, and then finally, identify um, what is appropriate for your organization in terms of security standards. I think all of those activities um, play off of one another. Sometimes your contracts are going to facilitate determination regarding security standards. Sometimes your, um, and certainly your data mapping will facilitate that as well. So I hope this was helpful for you in giving you some principles and examples regarding how to determine whether your organization is a controller or a processor. Um, and if you're looking for a place to start, I hope those four areas that we discussed today will be helpful to you. We have a few minutes left uh, for some questions, um, if, if th there are questions out there. Yes, we definitely have some. Um, first, you touched on this a little bit, Mark, but uh, the first question is, can you be classified as both a processor and a controller? Yes, absolutely. The most uh, easy way and clear way to an example to, to give for that, that case is an organization that serves as a processor for sort of its core business activity, um, sort of like a data analytics company um, that is a processor for its data analytics purposes, but has employees who are data subjects in the EU. And so for, in that case, the, the company would be a controller for the personal data that it receives from its employees and or contractors. And in our last webinar um, from last month, we go we dive into other types of roles. Um, so that's another place to look at for more information on that question. Um, can you clarify whether employee data and the handling of that data for payroll purposes makes an organization a controller or processor? So if if I understand the question, to, if it's for a payroll processor um, that is receiving personal data from uh, as a part of its business activities, but not from its employees, then I think there's a potential that that organization is a processor. If the payroll processor is, is conducting payroll processing for its own employees and those employees are EU data subjects, then it could be both a controller and a processor. But again, it's not just the, the processing activity, it's what kind of discretion is given uh, to the payroll processor. Can they um, market their services? Can they sell or transfer the data to another organization? Um, in, in that case, then the, the, process, the payroll processor could also be a controller. Um, okay. What, okay, if you don't use a third-party staffing firm for new hires, um, but data subjects submit their data through a website that goes to HR, is that site, does that site have any responsibilities under GDPR? Uh, I think that site would have responsibility, just based on the information you provide, I think it's very likely that site would have responsibilities under GDPR. Um, if our client, let's see, I think this one kind of relates. If our client sends their data to one of our third-party processors, would GDPR not apply to us, but rather our client or our third-party processor? It would depend on the interaction that your organization has with that data. Um, it, that, that, that sounds like a, a, a good discussion to have uh, at a more in-depth level. Um, because it's possible that, that if the data is never processed by your organization, which and processing is really broad, you can, if just accessing the data is processing, even deleting the data is processing, storing the data is processing, compiling the data is processing. So um, sounds like a, a question that would require some, some in-depth understanding of, of the relationship between the, your client, the third party, and your, your organization. Yeah, we're getting a lot of very specific um, examples of what your company does and asking whether you're a controller or a processor. Um, so before we hit on the specific ones, let me 
go through some of these more broad. Um, from the point of view of a controller, what are a few of the biggest risks associated with GDPR? Um, so a, a controller has the primary responsibility for facilitating the data subject's rights and the primary responsibility for um, handling uh, information security breaches. While a processor has to report breaches to a controller, the controller is the one that has to um, manage those to, with uh, respect to a supervisory authority. And then a controller is the one that's going to be subject to, to request to delete data. Um, and, and they'll have to communicate that down the line to their processors, but they're going to want, be the ones that have to determine whether or not to uh, comply with those requests. So um, I think the, the data subject requests, um, data breaches, and then also the consent element. I know that the way that many organizations have obtained consent to use personal data has been sort of the um, kind of default um, click here, and if you click here, you agree to the terms and conditions in the privacy policy, and, and some even less, some organizations even less transparent than that. But the way that organizations obtain consent, controllers could obtain consent to process data is going to have to be much more transparent and potentially cumbersome. So consent, data subject rights, and um, breaches, I think, are three areas of risk for controllers. These are great. Um, and what happens if you don't meet GDPR? Um, is that question intended to be what are the penalties? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. The penalties, are there are two sort of sets of penalties. Um, one of those is uh, they're based on flat fine amounts and then also um, revenue amounts. And those could be depending on their sort of tiers of penalties. And those could be up to 10 million dollars or 10 million euros, excuse me, um, or 2% of, of uh, global revenues or 4% of global revenues or 20 million euros, depending on the nature and severity of um, the violation. How are healthcare organizations seen under GDPR given the widespread collection, sharing, and use of data? Would the concept of covered entities in HIPAA translate to joint controllers? Yeah, so U.S. organizations that process the personal health and genetic data of EU data subjects are going to have some um, challenges that other organizations, um, other entities and in other industries are not going to, to face, although um, there may be other laws in the U.S. and abroad that, that apply to certain other areas. But from a healthcare perspective, your organization is going to have to determine where there is tension between HIPAA and GDPR. And one of those areas, for example, is data retention. GDPR says that the organization should only retain data for as long as it needs it, but HIPAA gives specific data retention requirements that go beyond just when, um, potentially when a uh, data subject needs it. So um, HIPAA does not give healthcare organizations in the U.S. Um, an out or an ability to not comply with GDPR. It's now going to be GDPR plus HIPAA and, and figuring out where those areas of tension are and making sure that you have good documentation and decision making in place so that you're able to navigate the times where um, data retention, for example, or a data subject request would be handled differently because you're subject to HIPAA um, than if you were just subject to GDPR. And as this additional note, um, healthcare and genetic data is a special category of data that is subject to additional stringency and requirements under GDPR. So healthcare organizations in the U.S. are immediately in a tougher spot than, than some other organizations are. We have several people asking what our services are in relation to GDPR and kind of a general time frame to help organizations work through GDPR compliance. Yeah, so I would point you primarily to two services, which would be a GDPR gap assessment and then a GDPR um, regulatory assessment that would be an audit. Um, and uh, we provide the, the gap assessments can be done on-site or remote. Those processes are much more condensed and intense um, in order to, to give organizations a sense of the areas of remediation. So we go through all the articles that are applicable 
um, to the organization as a controller, processor, or both. We identify whether there's gaps, and then we make uh, recommendations to uh, remediate those gaps. And then and that's typically seen um, as a pre-audit step. And then um, in the future, it would be coming back after remediation is completed and GDPR has gone into effect and we um, get into conducting audits where we're doing actual testing. So the difference between a gap assessment is we don't go in and test whether a policy or procedure is being um, complied with. We simply, uh, you know, kind of review the documentation, see if it exists, see if it's known by the, the company and see if it has the, the basic elements. But then an audit would come through and actually test to see, for example, that consent is obtained for all um, data subjects in the case of a controller, or that uh, agreements are in place and those agreements have, we would do sampling to see if those agreements have the required elements, things like that. If you have more questions about our services, we'd love to, to talk with you specifically about those. Our goal for these webinars is to inform you about our services, but it's, it's, to, it's more of an educational opportunity, but you can see my phone number and email address, and um, I'm happy to talk with anyone about our GDPR services. Yeah, um, either Mark or I, please get in touch with us if you're interested in finding out more about that. Um, one last question, Mark, that kind of goes along with that. Is there an anticipation of an annual audit from the ICO or the client organization for organizations that have an agreement? Um, you know, what I, what, I tip, what I expect to see and have seen is, is uh, contracts between controllers and processors having audit rights. But the law doesn't specifically set out audit requirements. It just uses the concept of demonstrable compliance. I think um, an annual audit is a, is a sound way of, of partly addressing that demonstrable compliance. But at this point, there is no specific annual audit requirement. I expect that certifications that may come out of the EU may give us more details on audit requirements and the contents thereof. Gotcha. There are a few unanswered questions that we aren't going to get to with those specific examples of your organization. I'm going to hook, hook those people up with Mark um, and get those questions answered um, after this webinar. So you'll see another email from me probably in your, email, in your inbox. Um, and tomorrow you will receive a copy of the slides and a recording of this webinar um, so you can Share it to anyone you need to and review it again and keep on learning about GDPR. Um, we have another webinar up on the website right now if you want more in depth. Um, and I'll also send out a link tomorrow to that ICO guidance if you're interested in looking at that. So thank you so much for joining us today, Mark. That was great. Um, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their day.